Hi everybody. I'd like to introduce a conversation I had recently with Greg Thomas about the killing of George Floyd and the resulting protests in the US. Greg has been on the channel before. He is a scholar of black American issues. He's also a jazz critic and an integral theorist. And when we originally met, it was to discuss Greg's work around using jazz as a technique to achieve collective intelligence. And we featured that conversation in a film called Lost Ways of Knowing. I was really happy to catch up with him and I hope you enjoy the conversation. So Greg Thomas, um, welcome back to the channel. It's, it's good to have you back. Thank you, Ali. Glad to be back. Well, Greg, you are a, you're an integral scholar and a jazz critic and a writer uh, among uh, other hats you wear. You were also a speaker at the Rebel Wisdom Festival last weekend. And during the festival, in, in one of your sessions, you talked about um, the, the, what we're seeing in the US right now, the, the horrific killing of George Floyd and, and the resulting um, protests that have sprung up. Um, so I just wanted to start there and just, just check in and, and, and ask how, how you felt when you first heard about, about that murder. Um, the first thought was, here we go again. And then not again. Um, it, it's like a, a scab on a wound that heals and gets torn off time and time again. So, um, and this is when I heard about it. This is before I even saw it. So it was, um, it was infuriating. It was something that it was such a graphic display of so many of the dynamics, not only the, the relationship between bad policing and the black American community, but power dynamics, the, the incredible and callous, it was the callous, casual approach that he took. He had his hands in his pocket as he was choking the life out of him with his knee. And he's looking around, seeing the people who's, who's saying to him, look, I mean, he says, I can't breathe. What you? And he keeps on going. So it's angering and saddening, as I said in the piece that you referenced. So right now, how, I, how do I feel? I feel, um, I feel kind of somber, but I also feel hopeful. And that's because I'm gonna tell you a quick story this morning. <laughs> I read what his six-year-old daughter, George Floyd's six-year-old daughter said. She said, my daddy has changed the world. And it brought me to tears, man. Um, this little girl who's gonna grow up without a father can see the uprising, the, the rebellion, the protest that have been generated through his violent death, coupled with Ahmaud Arbery, uh, Breonna Taylor, and a great list of others that it's like enough is enough, you know? But one of the things that makes me hopeful, a couple of things. One, the young people who are, who have risen up as young people tend to do generation after generation. So that gives me hope. I'm really inspired by not only the working class and intellectuals responding to what has been going on and raising their voices, but leaders of other sectors of the society, CEOs, leaders in their fields and industries, speaking out and speaking up. That's, that's something that I wouldn't have necessarily expected, and I don't think it's really happened before like this. And also what gives me hope is knowing how 
how life and culture work, that our reality as human beings uh, isn't just physical, it's also symbolic. And George Floyd as a symbol is not only a victim, his daughter was right. He is going to help change the world because he's a tragic hero. Tragic heroes die, but they still are heroes. And he sacrificed his life and he will be remembered and the world can change if we keep working towards it. So, so you're, a, you're a scholar of Black American issues and history in particular, Albert Murray and Ralph Ellison. Now, there is a, it seems obviously, I mean, there is a shared trajectory and story leading us right up until this point right now. I'm curious to get your thoughts on what's different or what do you, what do you feel is different about the culture that injustices like this are happening in now and the response to it compared to, say, in, in Ellison and Murray's day? Yeah, they came of age really in the midst of the late 50s and 60s, where, of course, you had the civil rights movement in the 60s, where for the first time, because of technology, you have news services actually covering protests. And because of the brilliant, genius strategy of nonviolent protest by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and SCLC and other organizations, you had a, the taping of just incredible uh, racist responses to kids trying to go to school, to people trying to vote. Uh, you have four little girls being blown up in a church in Alabama. You know, you have shit like that going on. But Dr. King knew that, and he, he was influenced by Gandhi, he was influenced by Emerson and many others. You know, he was a very learned man. He knew that if it were violent, one, black folks would be slaughtered, okay? You don't go up against an enemy that it that outmans you and that is itching hysterically itching to wipe you out you don't do that so he took the moral high ground and you saw black folks you know being water hosed uh being in a trying to sit in a, a kitchen counter and being hit and had milk poured over them and worse so that was the first instance where the media raised the consciousness of the country and the world in such a way that people were like, whoa, no, 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 just ain't right. Leading to, in 1965, the passing of the Civil Rights Act and such. You fast forward to today, you start with, say, Rodney King in 1990, California, with... Uh, his brutal beating by officers, and then them getting off, you know, uh, on up to today where we all, it ain't just the news media, we, we, we all got one of these, you know, and folks are taping stuff and it's being put up on social media and spreading virally around the world in no time. So um, that's the similarity. Well, some of the differences of what I mentioned earlier, I have never seen in so many sectors of the society, in so many levels of the society, a common voice. Though, of course, there are folks who are focusing more on the looting and the, and the rioting, which I call violent protest um, and rebellion, which I'm not, I don't concur with that. You got, you know, small businesses in Black neighborhoods being destroyed. But also I recognize that some of the people doing that are not necessarily from those areas or from the community. You got folks, I think, on the right and the left who want to foment chaos for their own ends, okay? 
But you got folks who focused on that more so than the violent, tragic deaths that precipitated the protests. You've talked about the two figures you, you were uh, talking about earlier, um, uh, Albert Murray and Ralph Ellison, as sort of proto-integral thinkers. Um, and it'd be, it'd be good to explore that a bit, but just, just first off, for anyone kind of not familiar with integral theory, why, why do you feel it's a useful frame for looking at, um, you know, race, identity, culture as a whole, and, and why is it useful now in particular? Yeah, for me, integral theory is like a heuristic. Um, it's, a, it's a way to frame, map, and model reality on different levels. Uh, so you take the four quadrants uh, of aqua, all quadrants, all levels that uh, Ken Wilbur talks about. The, the four quadrants are the inner and outer dimensions of individual and collective reality. Individual people, us as persons. So if you have on the, the top two, you have on the left side, the upper left, the subjective realm, the realm of our thoughts, you know, the inner part of us as individuals. And on the right, the upper right, you've got our bodies, our brains and such, right? And on the lower left, you've got the inner dimension of groups. And then on the lower right, you've got the inner dimensions of social dynamics, social structures. You could look at race through those quadrants. So one of the things that I have started to say is that to be an anti-racist, you have to, I think, interrogate and critique the very concept of race. Integral theory is powerful because it gives you a way to critique race as a theory and as a biological reality while acknowledging that it does find its place and land in other dimensions of life. So that's one perspective and one important way of looking uh, at race through integral theory. Another is developmental theory, uh, which in the last, I guess, 30 years, I'm really talking about adult developmental theory for the most part. Um, Carol Gilligan, Robert Keegan, Suzanne Groider, um, and others who have developed different theories of adult human development. But even without those, there are certain developmental theories that we can take a look at that are very helpful in understanding race, okay? So if you take one particular trajectory, traditional, modern, postmodern, integral, or say metamodern. Race, which has to do with outer appearance, phenotypic appearance, right? At the ethnocentric stage, if someone looks differently, whoa, that's like, hmm, you know, that's another. Um, then we get to the modern stage. Hey, uh, let's, let's get scientific. Let's look at race as, as whether or not it's actually a reality, uh, biologically. No. Then you get to postmodernism and it says, but race is a, is a uh, social construction. Yes. <laughs> and you get to integral. And you say, you know something as an index to human reality in terms of someone's intelligence, someone's potential, it don't mean nothing. How are you gonna judge somebody based on their outer appearance, the way they look, it is ludicrous. But <laughs> it's been particularly, you know, uh, with the advent of, 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 of the slave trade in Europe, as it came from uh, parts of Europe to the Americas, you know, it ended up becoming, when you added it to the, you know, theory of evolution, not as Darwin uh, uh, posed it, but as some people took his theory and used it to their own ends, you have what they call scientific racism, scientific justification for it. In the mythological sphere, you have, you know, uh, darkness, being viewed as akin to the devil and lightness being akin to all that's good. That, that's overlaid, right? Another way Integral looks at it is through the lens of like ethnocentric 
identity to more of a uh, regional or national identity to a world centric to a cosmocentric identity. And as you have these wider circles of care, concern, identification, the less and less you're likely to be beholden to a theory such as race, which is something Ralph Ellison called blood thinking. That's ethnocentric thinking that, you know, you have certain qualities of yourself because you're a member of a certain group and you have a certain blood and those qualities in the blood, you know, the, the hot, you know, Italians. Now, the thing is, these are stereotypes, which, and the thing about stereotypes, as they say, it has some semblance of truth, but you don't have to use it in an invidious way. You can use it as a way of appreciating, appreciating excuse me, the ethnic diversity and various styles and ways people move and live and talk and, and, and dance and eat in the world. You have an appreciation for difference in that way, you know? So um, I use integral theory to critique race uh, in those ways. And my particular focus really is centered in the lower left, the cultural dimension uh, in particular, um, as that's the place I think of um, meaning and tools of uh, values and principles of lifestyles based on those values that manifest as ways of being in the world and ways of creating art and other uh, tools or technologies in the world. Technologies that Albert Murray said are uh, survival tools that then are transmuted through your experience into play, through play, into art. Mm, that's great. J just to uh, uh, dive into something a little bit because I think it's worth unpicking <clears throat> and this is a really good point about integral giving us a kind of heuristic and a way to see things in different quadrants because a, a big part of the the anger right now and, and traditionally in, in culture when when one group is treated unfairly is that it is both a social construct but it's a lived reality and you sort of you sort of touched on that and so how, do, how does integral help us explain that because it always it, I think it's been I think for many people, there's a kind of tension there, but it, it sounds like you're, you're saying that in a way it's, it's in one area, it's a social construct from the kind of individual level, but then in the level of culture, for example, what we're seeing right now is, is the culture going through sort of a, a process of um, hopefully healing misconceptions that there are there around race and the way they manifest. So it seems like kind of both are happening in some way. Is that am I kind of reading that correctly? No, I think you are. And see, from an integral perspective, integral is supposed to be able to look at the, what they call first tier value means and look at the pros and cons of each. So, you know, from pre-modern to modern to post-modern to second tier, right? So if that's the case, we can look at the post-modern critique of, see, the postmodern critique of race as a social construction is also a critique of the efficacy of recognizing that race biologically is not real. They're like, you always hear them say, okay, that's true, but, but, but social structures and systemic racism, that's true. But I think we need to acknowledge, always acknowledge, because we need a, a platform from which we can look at some human commonalities right? True human commonality. So if we're going to say race, human race, you don't stop there. In your analysis, you have to look at the systems of oppression that have been uh, replicated and instantiated through the education system, healthcare, the legal system. Yes, but you can't stay there. I think it's really important. I think this is where the struggle is going. I was having a conversation with Diane Mushel Hamilton the other day, and she made the statement. She said, you know, when you look at the struggle, particularly from the 60s, there have been a lot of advances in terms of putting into the legal system things that outlaw, you know, out and out discrimination based on your identity, the different identity markers. That's true. 
She says, but I think the, I think the struggle, and now what we're seeing in the world, it's, it's on the left side. It's in the interiors now that we're actually doing the battle. So I think the IV space, you know, over the weekend, over uh, Rebel Wisdom Festival, both in the jazz presentation and in the Ellison Murray continuum presentation and in the, in the panel discussion, I referenced the I, we, it, which is a nice short for the four quadrants, you know, the I being the personal and subjective, the we being the uh, intersubjective, uh, the it being the individual externals and the uh, collective external of the social structure, but you just put it in it. So if the battle is in the I, we space, then that's where we need to focus primarily. Yes, acknowledge and fight those battles in terms of the systems and structures. But each of us as individuals and in working in with other people need to look at how can we make things better? What, what are the barriers that get in the way of us making things better? What are the good things from the ethnocentric stage? The mythopoetic dynamic, which is kind of, you know, modernism came and says, no, no, that's not rationally or scientifically true. But human beings need that. You are not going to get away from myth and ritual. You're not. Or if you do, you end up in some, you know, place of, like anomie or just not having a grounding, which a lot of people feel. So we need that. What we don't need from the ethnocentric is the xenophobic fear of the other and that then manifesting into violence. So you have to, so integral allows us to balance these things in a way to look at the pros and cons, embrace the pros and work together with others towards the better. Wonderful, wonderfully said. Um, so just, just before we finish, Greg, do you have any, is, is there anything we didn't cover? Anything you want to express? Uh, yeah. Anything at all? Oh my. Um, I'll use some words from the movement. Keep the faith. Aluta continua. The struggle continues. Know that the battle is not going to be won ultimately in a week, a month, a year, that this struggle, this epic struggle, and Frederick Douglass said that without struggle, there is no progress. That this struggle is an ongoing struggle because it's not just a struggle against oppressive structures. This is a struggle against mindsets that people have and have, in, have inherited generationally, okay? Speaking of generationally, I would also like to say to my people, my ethnic cultural kin, that our struggle has been an epic struggle, an epic and heroic struggle, and that though we have been victimized, we ain't just victims. And that it's important for us to know that we have agency and responsibility also, and it's not just about what others can do to change themselves. Well, speaking of the others, some others do need to change themselves. And for my fellow Americans who, and outside of America, but let's focus on America, who identify as white, as a racial identity, I suggest asking yourself some questions. What does being white mean to me? What does whiteness mean to me? I disagree with the postmodernist uh, perspective of, uh, of, of anti-fragility that says that if you're white, see, it used to be if you're white, uh, you're right. Uh, it, uh, if you're brown, stay down. If you're black, you know, hold back or something like that, you know. <laughs> but now it's like if you're white, you're in, from certain uh, uh, activists and, and, and academics, if you're white, you are automatically guilty. And what Albert Murray said is, you know, as a strategy for uh, engaging with people, guilt is not the best strategy. 
intelligent action is a much better <laughs> strategic approach. But I would ask folks who consider themselves white to ask them certain themselves certain questions. And, and I wanna leave, as I like to do, with a point of hope. I do not agree with my postmodern friends who suggest that if you are white, not only are you guilty, you are, you are beholden to a history of oppression that means that white supremacy reigns supreme. No, that makes no distinction between white privilege, white superiority, and white, and white supremacy. It's the overuse of the word white supremacy, and Albert Murray called it the folklore of white supremacy. Unless you believe that white supremacy is actually real, then don't just be saying white supremacy, white supremacy. You, it's like a mantra, you know? But white folks do need to look at themselves. So it's a conversation that quote unquote white people need to have amongst themselves. And it's a conversation that we need to have together so we can then create through empathetic listening and generative listening, a way to create a better future together. So there's some inquiry that has to happen. Most people don't like to do it. Most people don't like to, to, to do that kind of self-reflection because it's not easy, it's, not, it's, it's painful, you know? But not only without struggles, there's no progress, without some pain and learning, there is no growth. I was also really struck by, um, you know, when we've spoken before is, is that that combination of utter injustice and hopelessness and despair and hope. And you've talked about that in relation to the blues and that, and that being so fundamental to the black American experience. I'd love to just hear, hear what it is about the blues. What's the blues attitude to, to that? Well, um, the blues is, um, as Ralph Ellison once said, an autobiographical, autobiographical chronicle of a catastrophe expressed lyrically. That's one, that's a poetic kind of uh, description. His, his partner and, and, and dear friend and comrade uh, in the struggle, Albert Murray, who was a mentor of mine, as I said in the Rebelism Festival, he coined a phrase called the blues idiom. And the blues idiom uh, to Murray was a way that Black Americans confronted absurdity, uh, oppression, existence itself. So it's an existential perspective on life that says life is a low down, dirty shame. That's a fact. But you know something? We're going to be as intentional and purposeful as we can. We're going to be clear on our goals and objectives and our visions, and we're gonna to work towards it. It says that we are going to develop the kind of skill sets and heart sets and soul sets that will give us the wherewithal to withstand the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. And with those skills and the individual excellence that in the model that my partner and wife, Jewel and I have, uh, you don't do it just as a heroic individual, you do it as a heroic collective. You do it with other people in such a way that you can make things better. So the blues, acknowledges the low down dirty shameness of life. It doesn't deny it. It doesn't deny it, repress it. It says it as the Thelonious Monk song says, straight no chaser. But at the same time, we're going to acknowledge, recognize and embrace joy, even if it's momentary. We're going to we're gonna dance, we're gonna, we're gonna express ourselves with our bodies, with that embodied cognition. And we are going to celebrate and affirm the very 
reality and existence of life itself. And my kinfolk, Black folks, do that very well, which is why Ralph Ellison once wrote, he says, you know, uh, for the blues, the spirituals, the jazz, the dance is what we had in place of freedom, in place of social, political, and economic freedom. But we expressed ours culturally. That's why I look to culture as such a powerful place for the responses to life and to injustice that, uh, that not only we as a people, but that, I mean, the blues is something that may have originated and did originate with black Americans, but the blues is universal, you know? You know, in Buddhism, when they talk about, you know, life is suffering, that's the blues, man, you know? So it's something that, you know, is rooted yet can be embraced and should be embraced. In fact, has been embraced by people around the world, embrace the blues and jazz, which is the, as Murray says, the extension, elaboration and refinement of of the blues aesthetic. Great, Thomas, thank you. You're welcome, thank you, man. Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change, which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching, and see you soon.